Uh, there's many different scriptures in Hinduism, but, but broadly they're broken into two main categories. The one, the Smriti scriptures, which are inspired by the gods and by the avatars. The avatars are, uh, are divinities that uh, are incarnated. Krishna was an avatar of Vishnu in the, in the story of the Bhagavad Gita. And so one portion of scripture is called the inspired scriptures. The other is remembered, remembered scripture. And so they roughly break down these various uh, scriptures, uh, multitudes of scriptures in, in Hinduism in those two broad categories, uh, which it might be interesting for you to be aware of that. And so this war is going on. And as the dialogue takes place, in the chariot between uh, Arjuna and Krishna, who is the avatar, the incarnation of the god Vishnu, um, Krishna explains that there are three ways to salvation. Now you'll find very quickly that this is quite different than the Upanishads, where there's only one way, the recognition that all is Brahman. But uh, in the dialogue taking place in the chariot, Krishna points out three paths to salvation. The first one we have already talked about, and that is the path of karma. Follow the law of your caste. That's essential if you're going to find salvation. And what does salvation mean? What does it mean? Salvation is to get off the samsara the wheel of incarnation and reincarnation. That's salvation. And to become absorbed into the universal Brahman. So when they talk about salvation in Hinduism, it is not the same as a Christian talking about salvation, who thinks of abundant life now and eternal life uh, in the future, uh, after death. That's not the Hindu view of salvation at all. It is to be absorbed into the universal. So how can you become absorbed into the universal so that the cycle of birth and rebirth ceases, of incarnation and reincarnation ceases. You notice I'm pretty careful not to use rebirth, because rebirth would suggest the total body being born again, being reborn, but not so in Hinduism. It's only the soul, only the Atman that is born again, that is reborn and reborn. So we say reincarnation, not rebirth. So the, the, the path of becoming absorbed into the universal, first of all, has to do with obeying the law of your caste. Secondly, secondly, it is the realization that all is Brahman. The realization that all is Brahman, and we've talked about that. Now to come to a, a, um, a realization that all is Brahman, Th that is where the practice of yoga is introduced into Hinduism. Because yoga practices help you to lose a sense of personal identity. For example, some years ago I was traveling with a group of, uh, of Hindus. I was driving and they were traveling with me. And then they said, we're going to pray. I don't have the exact phrase they used as they prayed, but it went something like this. If a Hindu were hearing me, he would say, oh, David, you have butchered it. It wasn't quite that way. But this is, this is how I remember it. Om, 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 Mani Padmi Om, 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 Mani Padmi Om. That went on for half an hour as we traveled to our destination. So I thought I was going a little bit crazy with this divine word that they were chanting over and over again. So when we arrived at our destination, I asked these Hindu friends, could you address your prayer to God as a conversation? I said, Jesus taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, and then to bring our requests to God, interpersonal relationship, 
father-son relationship. Would that be possible? Oh, no, 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 they said that would not be possible, you see. So what they were doing was uttering divine phrases that they hoped would help them to lose their sense of identity, of personal identity, and be absorbed into the universal Brahman. That's what they were doing. And so repeating this divine phrase over and over again, the intention was to lose your sense, my sense, that I'm David W. Schenck. To lose that sense, and rather to replace that sense that I'm a person with the conviction, with the, exper with the experiential conviction, uh, that I am actually absorbed into the universal Brahman. So that's the second path for salvation, and that's what yoga is. That's what they were doing in the car. They were practicing a form of yoga by repeating those names over and over again. And there's many different kinds of yoga, um, all of it having to do with losing your sense of personal identity, that you're becoming absorbed into the universal. And so the breathing exercises, the sitting exercises, the, the, uh, the various bodily exercises, all of this is to bring you into, into convergence with the universal Brahman and absorption into the universal Brahman. So that's the second path of salvation. What's the first one? Karma. Karma, that's the, that's the deeds that your caste requires you to do. Uh, what does um, uh, Arjuna's caste demand that he does? He should go to war. If he doesn't go to war, that's bad karma. So you must do the deeds that your caste determines that you must do. That's path number one. Path number two, become aware, reality, really aware that all is Brahman. And to do that, you need to practice yoga to lose your sense of identity. The third path for salvation, for absorption into the universal Brahman, the third path is to choose the God of your choice and worship the God of your choice. And that is called bhakti. Bhakti. To choose the God of your choice and worship that God. Remember, we said uh, yesterday that uh, within Hinduism, uh, they say there's something like 300 million gods. You have plenty of gods to choose from. Choose any one of them. You'll choose the one that you think will be the most helpful. But uh, you go to Hindu temples, they're filled with divinities. Maybe one temple is uh, dedicated to the god Vishnu. Uh, that's okay. Worship the god Vishnu, but you can worship many other gods as well. Um, so choose the God of your choice and worship that God. And so Hinduism has multiplied divinities um, which people are devoted to and look to for help in the process of getting off this samsara wheel that takes you in repeated reincarnations, but also helps you with the everyday factors of life. Maybe you are a student and you're coming to your fourth uh, year of, uh, of high school and you want to do good grades. So you'll go to a nearby temple and you'll worship the God of your choice and bring offerings to that God and uh, venerate that God and uh, bow before that God and pray to that God that this God will help you in your examinations. So you choose the God of your choice. So those are the three paths to salvation which are described in the Bhagavad Gita. Quite different than the Upanishads because in the Upanishads, the only way that is recommended, that is recognized, is to <laughs> realize that all is, all is Brahman and to become absorbed into that universal Brahman. But here within the uh, Bhagavad Gita, which means the song of the Lord, there is these various three paths of salvation. Mahatma Gandhi, who was the spiritual and political leader taking India to independence from the British Empire, uh, he said that his favorite scripture in all of Hinduism is the Bhagavad Gita, that that scripture he found very, very helpful. I'm always amazed at that because the Bhagavad Gita recommends, in fact, commands to go to war if that is the task of your caste. And Mahatma Gandhi was a pacifist. He did not believe in violence. He embraced nonviolence. 
So I'm never quite sure why he felt the Bhagavad Gita was such a significant scripture. I don't understand that. Uh, but uh, he always felt the Bhagavad Gita was very important. And maybe that's one reason it is such a popular scripture in Western societies, the Bhagavad Gita. I think another reason it is very significant is because it does champion relativism. There's no, there's no universal moral center in the Bhagavad Gita. It's follow the teachings of your caste. That's what it's about. Listen. <clears throat> Can such acts bring evil? Brahman is the ritual. Brahman is the offering. Brahman is he who offers to the fire that is Brahman. If a man sees Brahman in every action, he will find Brahman. That every action, whether it is a cruel action or a kind action, is Brahman, you see. So this is universal relativism, <laughs> which the Bhagavad Gita teaches as the way. There's no universal moral boundaries. Follow the law of your caste. But there's no universal truth or universal moral boundaries. Choose the God of your choice. You are born in a particular caste. Follow the teachings of that caste. But remember that every action you do, whether it is a cruel action or a good action and a kind action is equally Brahman. There is no action that is outside of Brahman, you see. This is what we refer to as dogmatic moral relativism, which I think is one reason the Bhagavad Gita finds so much popularity in many cultures where they don't want moral boundaries, um, where you want to have a system which affirms that every action you do is equally divine, all this Brahman. It would be good to have a Hindu here commenting on that. And you might say, well, a corrective to that kind of philosophy uh, is the assertion here that you do, at the end of the day, need to follow the boundaries set by your caste. But this is universalism. It is, it is a it's dogmatic relativism, which we meet here within the Bhagavad Gita. While we continue being a benevolent project, your kind donations will continue to be vital in fulfilling the calling of TVS ministry. We do count on your gracious support and cooperation. For detailed information, please visit tvsseminary.com.